Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today, we have on first-time guest, Katrina Reyes. Katrina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Katrina, you have a fascinating story. You're from Russia. Yes, Siberia, Russia. Siberia, the far the far northern part of Russia. And um, you joined the Sea Org at 11 years old. How That's that- correct. How does it happen? You're a little girl. You're 11 years old. You're from Russia. How do you wind up in the Scientology Sea Organization? Well, it's actually um, interesting because my grandmother, uh, she was into uh, Herbalife. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Herbalife? Yeah, 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 Herbalife. Yeah. Yeah. So she came to actually uh, Clearwater for some kind of conference or something like that and a Scientologist was in it and he got her into Scientology and a month later she joined the Sea Org at Flag. Wow, so, she doesn't she moves pretty fast then. Yeah, it kind of overwhelmed her and overtaken her, I guess. And that's not uncommon, uh, Katrina. Many people who, who go into Scientology say, This is it, I'm going into the Sea Org now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, she was a woman that kind of always wanted a purpose in life. Uh, She didn't want to live like a regular life, nine to five job. So for her, this was like a purpose and something exciting to do. I can imagine. And then so so your grandmother's in the Sea Org and does she talk to your mother about it or how does the family take it? Well, my grandmother kind of always been like the, uh, the um, how can I say it, in a nicer way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say she abandoned her family, but she kind of always did her own thing. And she didn't really participate that much in the family affairs. Um, so when she joined the Sea Org, um, she started doing the Purif. And she didn't. Uh, she had to complete the PRF before her visa, her tourist visa from Herbalife, ran out. And the uh, the Sea Org wouldn't com- let her leave until she finishes the PRF, which actually legally she ended up staying a couple days later than her visa. So then she was actually banned from coming back to the United States for 10 years. Really? Yeah. And since she couldn't come back to the United States, they posted her as, so she gave, they give her a job in the Moscow org, um, as an FSC. So she was recruiting people to come to flag for services. Flag service consultant? Flag service consultant. Yeah. Or something along those lines. And and these are people who sell, who register people and sell services to come to flag land base in Clearwater. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, since they couldn't have her in Clearwater, they put her on a job in Moscow. So she ended up having that job there as an FSM or now, FSC. Now, Katrina, I'm just curious, and I don't know if if you would know, but how does the Russian government view Scientology? Isn't there? I mean, they've raided Scientology orgs. Did your grandmother have any problems with the Russian government being a Scientologist in Moscow? Um, they don't have a particular, um, I mean, they raided the org only because, quote unquote, they were selling religious materials that were banned. So Russian government doesn't recognize Scientology as religion. Um, they allow them to operate pretty much as a business, uh, but they don't allow them to sell certain religious materials, which is majority of Elvin Herbert's books. True. True. So your, your grandmother's working now. D- does your mother come next into Scientology? Yeah, my grandmother little by little started sending us little uh, booklets and courses and books to Siberia. And uh, my mother was doing pretty roughly in life. She wasn't in a good place. Um, so she was kind of down and I guess also seeking some kind of stability in her life. Um, so that kind of pulled her in. 
And then my grandmother enticed her with, you know, why don't you join the Sea Org? You're going to go to America. You're going to have a stable life. You're going to have a roof over your head. You know, you're going to have a good job. You can pick a job that you want. And you're going to be helping so many people. So my, my mother fell for that, pretty much. The American dream really is what she fell for. Well, now that's very interesting you'd say that. Uh, two observations. Uh, Scientology is very highly structured. And so if a, per, a, a person were having difficulties in life and they felt lost, Scientology does, from the outside, offer a very highly structured environment that you can go into, offers to improve your life, but you also get to, to go out chase the American dream. That's correct. I mean, and and we were very poor. I just want to add. <laughs> I mean, for for us to have a toilet in the house was like a luxury. So for um, being in a Sea Org, those were a decent living conditions, I guess I could say. Now, did did your mother joining the Sea Org was that to come to America uh, to to flag land base as well? Yes. And did she, so did she tell you, uh, Katrina, pack your bag, we're moving to America? She pretty much told me we're going to Moscow um, to see your grandmother and I have to do some courses uh, for us to join this organization. So uh, we went to Moscow. We were there for six months. I did like a children's communication course. And then after six months, we signed the contract, and they put the contract, the CR contract, in front of me. And my mother basically told me, "We're going to go to this place. It's going to be nice. You can, you know, we're going to have our own room, and never going to have to problem, never going to have to worry about food or roofs over our heads and things like that. You're going to go to school. We're going to be in America." Um, and I just said, "Okay. I mean, I have no choice. She's my mother. I have nobody else. So I just..." Did what she told me to. Now, where's your dad? Had he been? Uh, had your parents been divorced? My biological father. Uh, I actually haven't seen him or heard from him since I was three. Um, my mother is married right now in the Sea Org, and that's actually my fourth stepdad. <laughs> so I've had. My mother had a lot of men issues. Let's just put it that way. Well, but also to be fair, divorce is very common in Scientology. Yes. And I, I mean, I even know uh, uh, American Scientologists, uh, that, you know, here who have been divorced three, four times. Tom Cruise himself has three divorces. Oh, no, she ha- she yeah. was divorced before Scientology. This stepfather that I have right now who is in the Sea Org, they actually have been together the whole time since 2000. Oh, okay. So, you're, so that your mother married and divorced so they now she got into a stable marriage in the sea Org. yes since 2000 okay i mean to kind of add a little bit to to, to, for people to understand um my mother never had she's a very how can i put this she's a very wild spirit (laughs) <laughs> putting it in the light ways, um, you know, she had me at 17, you know, divorce, a teenager, went through a lot, um, and living in a poor country, I personally think for her, this was like, this is a place where they have a set of rules that's going to keep me in check and it's going to keep me in line because she couldn't keep herself in line, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely, and and like I, like I was said earlier, Scientology is highly structured. So for, so for someone like that who who does not have any stability, that would be a place that would appeal to them. Exactly. And and by the way, I have to add, if I were ten years old and my you know my family said, uh, "Hey, Grandma, join the Sea Org," it would be like, "What what does that mean? Why is Grandma going off joining this thing?" and you're really trying to survive and you're with your mother and she's all you have and exactly your, and your grandmother so this is your full family going in basically exactly yeah so you're in moscow and you did some ch- children's courses and your mother does some um, some courses so that qualify her to go to flag yes exactly 
Now, when the, when the Church of Scientology flies you and your mother from Moscow, do you go straight to Clearwater, or is there a stop in between, or how does that actually work logistically? Well, first we had um, we actually had to go get our visas, um, which at that point back in ninety nine, basically the whole of all of nineties, Russia and United States had very strenuous relationships, and the visas were very hard to get. Um, so Church of Scientology arranged for us to get a religious working visas, and uh, we went to get a we went to the council. Um, to counsel it to have an interview with a U.S. representative, and I remember them coaching me, <laughs> telling me specifically that um, we're going there on a religious uh, mission to volunteer, and the main part to address, they told me, make sure you tell them that you're definitely coming back. Um, so, so this is the Church of Scientology advising you want to tell the American consulate. Well, they kind of passed their message through my grandmother, yes. Yeah, but I understand. But the, but the whole idea is they're coaching you. Yes. And they know what the American consulate wants to hear. And the point I'm making is Scientology has routinely exploited and manipulated uh, R1 religious worker visa system. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you're coached what to say, and the, the, the consulate approves the visas on the condition that you're, you will be coming back from... Clearwater. Yes, and we had yeah. to prove that we were going to come back. So, you know, we had to show ties and relatives and that we don't have anybody else in America. So, yeah, they approved our visas and we get our uh, tickets to go to Clearwater. We had, I think we had two layovers. One was in Frankfurt, one was at JFK, and then we landed at uh, Tampa Airport. Yeah, that's a long, long flight. Very. Now, when you land in when when you land in uh, Tampa, are you you're met by Sea Org representatives? Um, no, we were told to look out for those vans, the white vans, the shuttle vans that go to the airport. It's going to have like the big flag logo on the side. Oh yeah, the courtesy vans. Yeah. Yes. So we we're told to look out for that van, and we stepped out. And we were just, we stood there maybe for an hour, we were waiting for that van, and then finally that van arrived. And then they brought us, um, it was very late already, it was around 11 or midnight, and they brought us to Fort, the van brought us to Fort Harrison. And then did they feed you, get you uniforms, or what, what, what how do they, what's the intake system? When you arrive into America, into the Sea Org, what do they do when you arrive late at night? Is it just, here, go to bed, and we'll work on it the next day? or? Well, we were hungry, um, and we were told we can go and purchase some <laughs> food <laughs> at the Fort Harrison Canteen that they have there. It's like a little store with food and stuff like that. Um, so I just remember buying a, like a protein bar with milk I think my mom got for me. Um, and then security guard met us and he told us that the whole process will be started in the morning. So we asked him how we're going to go to sleep, where we're going to go to sleep. Again, we didn't speak a lick of English. We, I didn't speak English. My mother didn't speak English. So they actually brought a Russian security guard in order to communicate with us. And they sent us off to um, a motel. It was a student motel. Um, and they told us, you're going to stay here for one night, come back tomorrow morning at this time, take the van, the shuttle van, come back tomorrow to Coachman, to the recruiting part, to the recruitment department, and you have to do all the process of routing in. And so what happens the next morning when you're out in? Is it just paperwork and interviews or... Um, you have to fill in this huge form where it's literally you have to, it disclose every single moment, part of your life. Have you ever done drugs? I mean, literally, I, I think those types of forms people have to fill out when they like join the Secret Service or FBI. Yeah, and this, <laughs> is mean, the, this is the life history form. Yes. Um, I was 11. I didn't have much to fill in there, but. My mom had a lot to fill, so I filled it in. My mother filled it in, and then you had to pass a security 
uh, e-meter check to make sure that you answered all those questions correctly and you weren't lying about anything or, you know, left something out. Um, and I remember my mother passed really fast the first try and I didn't pass and for, and they were keep asking me, you need to, you know, write down more. What did you miss? Maybe you forgot something. And I'm 11 years old. I have nothing to really put on there. You know how much life sure, I what? have at 11. Yeah. Um, and then I just couldn't pass it for the life of me. And then my mother was like, well, she hasn't eaten today. And it was already like one o'clock in the afternoon. So they're like, oh, she needs to go eat. That's right. So they sent me to the Clearwater building, the Clearwater Bank building, where the older staff used to eat. And uh, they gave me lunch, uh, which was like a sandwich. That was like a tuna salad sandwich. Um, and I came back, and then I was able to pass the meter check. Yeah, and just for Scientology, uh, new people uh, who are not familiar with Scientology, if you don't have enough sleep or you have, you're not properly nourished, you can't pass what's called the metabolism on the e-meter. Yes, and you. Yeah, so often the solution is to feed or get a nap or both. Yes, exactly. So you passed your you passed your security check. They knew you weren't sent in by the communist government. Exactly. <laughs> that was one of the questions. Was like, have you ever been part of um, KGB? I remember that. It was, have really? you ever been part of KGB? Yes. <laughs> and you're 11. Are you a member of the KGB? Well, that goes to L. Ron Hubbard's paranoia that uh, people are always being sent into Scientology to sabotage them. Yes. And, and, and our, uh, my first uh, security check when I was just a, a pre-clear, early 80s, I remember they asked if I had been sent in by the government agency, the CIA, the FBI, law enforcement, was I a journalist, was I connected to these psychiatric organizations? I was thinking, this is bizarre. Yes. And at you, you at 11, were you going to be the, you know, the master 11 year old girl KGB spy? Yes. Anyway. They have trained me since I was born. <laughs> yeah, you were <laughs> born into the KGB. So, okay. So you, you pass your test that is the next part you get uniforms and you get your, uh, or are you put on estates project force or? Yes. Yeah. I was put on a state's uh, project force, EPF. Uh, but before that, you have like a routing form with all the terminals that you have to go see, get your uniform, um, you know, go see the um, estates, um, the EPF IC, the person who's in charge. Um, and so we went through the whole uniform, uh, the whole routing form is what they call it. And uh, that's it. I think by the end of the night, we were already officially assigned to the EPF. And I just want to add a couple things, again, for new Scientology watchers. Um, in Scientology, people are not called people. They're called terminals. Yes. So when you, <laughs> so when you, you have to go see a, a, a list of people. But in Scientology, it's a list of terminals. You have a terminal. And uh, EPF is uh, State's Project Force. It is a Scientology boot camp to see if you're, you, you can, you know, it's to prepare you for Sea Org life. Now, did they take your passports, by the way? You and your mother, did they take your passports? Yes, they did. The um, EPF MAA, which is a master at arms, which is basically a person who's in charge of your ethics, your history, you know, you get in trouble for something, that's the person you go to to get fixed, handled. Um, when on the routing form, when we got to him, they took our passports. So now they have your passports and you're in another country. Yes. Okay. So how do you, did they, do you and your mother get to stay together or do they separate you? Um, on the SH Project Force, we stayed together. Yes. We were um, in a room. We were sharing a bunk bed. And uh, it was actually six people in one room. <laughs> so three bunk beds in one room. Well, that's nice and cozy. Uh, but they do tend to cram people into small spaces. Um, what, what was your experience as, as a child of the EPF? Did they make you do a lot of just work? I mean, janitorial work? What, what did they make you do? Um, 
a lot. Um, basically, every single day we would have um, like a meeting, what they called a muster. And you all have to line up and you have your units, you know, like four or five people in each unit. And then people pretty much who work for the CEO work from all the different departments, you know, from the kitchen, from the restaurants, from the cleaning crew, they will all come over and basically pick us out. You know, I want this unit to come and clean with me today. So um, we would be assigned to do anything from going into the galley where they served staff at the Clearwater building and scrubbing the nasty gross huge pots and pans and those huge stoves the grills to doing construction on the St. Castle Hotel and the advanced organization um, we completely got it out and renovated the RTC birthing uh, housekeeping at the hotels uh, and just regular cleaning Fort Harrison hotels and the St. Castle Hotel. You as a, a young girl, you don't really know what Scientology is or what it's about. You just are following orders at this point. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I was you... I was very unhappy with my mother because I was promised school and like I was promised this, you know, nice room and you know, all this stuff and obviously none of that looked what they promised. And I brought it up with my mother, and I, I, was, I told her, I said I was really unhappy about this whole thing. And um, she told me, just wait. You just have to finish the EPF, and then when you, then, then, then things will get better. This is just a temporarily boot camp, and it has to be tough. So I said, okay, fine. You're, you know, I, I get it. Okay, fine. But the thing is that I actually had a medical condition, Um way before I've had problems with my kidneys since I was five years old. Um, so I couldn't lift anything heavy. It was against uh, medical doc uh, medical doctors and everything. Like it was against their orders for me to lift anything heavy. So when we were sent to construction, I would tell them I can't do it. And I would get, I will actually got in trouble on several occasions because I refused to follow orders. Well, you couldn't. I mean, if you if you have a physical condition, were they willing to understand that, or or did they view that as uh, counter intention? Uh, at first, they thought it was just I was just being lazy. I was being a bratty kid, you know, who just doesn't want to work. Um, and then I kept my foot down. I I refused to, you know, just lay down and say do whatever you want. Because I was actually in a lot of physical pain, I started to feel my, my side starting to hurt again. And in Russia, I was hospitalized on several occasions because I have a really bad kidney infection. Um, so eventually, they decided to handle me by sending me to Purif because, uh, because I was hospitalized so many times. I've gotten so many drugs. I had to sweat all those drugs out, and that will handle my kidneys. <laughs> But those, but those high doses of niacin are the worst things for your kidneys. What, what happened on the purification rundown? I was on the purification rundown for a year, and I never finished it. For one year? For almost one year, eleven months. That's just incredible. Yeah, and I and I never finished it, and I think they just gave up because they didn't know what to do with me. I just couldn't. I couldn't achieve the end phenomena, what they call it in Scientology. That you know. I just, I couldn't say I felt better. I felt worse every day. And they just took me off and I never finished. Oh, well, one thing I wanted to say, uh, if they had promised you and your mother, you know, that you'd go to school and you'd have a room and all that, just as a side note, uh, Scientology is certainly guilty of fraudulent inducement. That is lying to people overseas to get them to come to America. Oh, for sure. And this is really something Russian consular officials, Mexican consular officials, uh, you know, others, uh, other Venezuela. consular officials, yeah, who, who, who have foreign nationals at flag land base in Clearwater should take cognizance of because there is fraud. There's outright fraud. And my view, uh, Katrina, uh, jumping ahead of things, flag land base is really just a, a hotel. It's a big series of hotels. And Scientologists go there and stay and they get auditing. 
yes. the Sea Org members basically are just hotel workers. A under hotel, the guy, yeah, yeah, you're, you're just hotel workers, you're dishwashers, gardeners, maids, janitors, and they call it religious work, but it's not. It's just hotel work, and and Scientologists who who go at the hotel are paying top dollar to stay there. And, it's uh, back in 2006. It was about uh, 349 dollars a, a night at the Sand Castle. Oh, you could set the Hilton so much cheaper. I know. But there's rules that you have to stay on the base. Yes, okay. for sure. You have to stay on the base. You and this was, yeah, this was part of Aaron Hubbard's plan. We will we'll earn money by making you stay in our hotels. So, well, they tried to they they tried to suck money out of you in every single aspect. So, you stay in our hotels. You eat in our restaurants. You um, buy you know your necessities like shampoos and all that stuff you know, in our little store and they literally suck every single cent that they can possibly suck out of you by making you purchase all that from them. Of course. And while they're not, okay, so, so you're, let's go back to your story. I just wanted to sidetrack and that is the point in there. And they're doing this on top of basically slave labor. Okay. You, what, are you making any money at 11 years old? Are they paying you while you're on the pure off? I got paid $25 and then they would take out taxes so it would add up to 22 and change or 23 or something like that. And then after the pure off, so you have enough money to what, what, maybe buy protein bars and hygiene items or? Barely. I mean, yeah. barely. The food was so horrible um, that a lot of times they have like their little canteen area where the staff can go and purchase snacks and all that and I would pretty much spend majority of my money just buying food because I just couldn't I couldn't bear eating the disgusting food that they were serving well what well what did they serve you as a Sea Org worker I know they try to spend as like maybe a dollar a day two dollars a day on food you know maximum so what what would they feed you as a child well we got the same food as everybody else um not everybody else. The executive dining room, they got better. They got much better food. Sure. But the regular CIRC members, uh, so FLAG is divided into two organizations. One is FSO, FLAG Service Organization, and the other one is FLAG Crew. And the FLAG Crew is the one that's the gardeners and the, and the, uh, you know, the people that serve food at the restaurant, the cooks and all that, the, the housekeepers. And the FSO are the people who are delivering the, the auditing and the courses for the public that comes to stay there. And the FSO um, would eat first, and then the flag crew would eat at the second shift at 7 p.m. So I would eat at the first shift. Uh, the EPF would eat at the end at 7 p.m., pretty much after everybody ate. And it was pretty much just the leftover scraps that was left in the kitchen and a lot of times though let's just say if it was a friday it was burgers and hot dogs and that was like the best you, you could possibly think of um but let's just say if they ran out of burgers and hot dogs for for the meals for everybody else for the early dinner settings then we would get like rice and beans or completely nasty and disgusting running eggs so it's pretty much slop slop Leftover no. slop. Yes, and, I, and I've heard many, many Sierra members say it's slop. It was horrible, and they would spend money at the company store in the canteen to get something better. Now, when you finish uh, the purification rundown or when when they throw you out of it, what's your first post at F Flag? I was, I've, I was put right away, and that was my only post throughout the whole time. I was a technical page in the advanced organization at um, St. Castle, which for people who don't, you know, for new listeners who don't know anything about Scientology, a technical page, their job is to line up the schedule for the public who are coming in for the services, make sure that they arrive on time, make sure that they are what term is used as sessionable, that they have had enough hours of sleep, that they ate recently, and that they're ready to go into session. Sierra support staff. 
uh, to the people who are doing the auditing. Yes. Yeah. And, the, the, the administration stuff and the support stuff, yes. Yeah, because there's actually a lot of work that goes on to deliver an hour of auditing in the Church of Scientology. There's yes. All, all kinds of behind the scenes things that go on. What does your work day consist of? What time do you get up? How long do you work? What time do you go to bed? We normally had um, a, a muster at 7.30. So oh, we had to be the, in the same castle by 7.30. So I normally would get up around 6.00. I would get on the bus. We lived at a Hacienda Gardens. I would get on the bus, go to the Clearwater Building, the bank building, to eat breakfast, um, and get back on the bus and be in the St. Castle by 7.30. Um, I would work pretty much until lunchtime, which was 1 o'clock for me, and then I would have lunch from 1 to 1.30, and then I would go back to work until 7 and then I will have my dinner from 7 to 7 45 and then I will go for my you know my study the two and a half hours all the SIG members are supposed to study LRH courses for two and a half hours a day so I would go to study in the evening until 10 o'clock and then I would go back to work back to St. Castle and it depends from day to day but I never left before 11.30. And you're a, a young teenager. Yes. Now, what's, what I'm hearing missing in your description of, of life, there's no education. Are you learning to read or write? Well, all of their courses, like the Estate Project Force courses, which was the main five courses to get you prepared for Sea Org, and a lot of the other courses are all translated into English, uh, from English to Russian. So uh, they had the courses in Russian. Um, and But for me, since I had to learn English at first, actually while I was on the EPF, on the um, Estate Project Force, I would also do courses to study English. Was it hard for you to learn English as a child? Or, or, because I, I understand children have an easier time of learning English so did two questions did your mother speak English or did she have to learn it and did, did you learn English easier than your mother um I definitely learned it easier than my mother uh, she still has a very thick accent I don't it's true kids do pick up languages faster um, but I had a very good motivation to learn English as well as possible and that's because a lot of the Pack Range kids, Pack Range was the place where all the kids of uh, Sea members in LA, they all got shipped down to Clearwater to join the Sea Org at the same time as we started the EPF. And they were all about my age, between 11 and 15. And they used to make fun of me. Oh, yeah. So I. Uh, the, you know, sometimes it would, when I started learning English, sometimes I would say a couple, uh, you know, they would talk to me and I'd be like, what does that word mean? And it's like a bad word. And they would all laugh at me and things like that. So it was, so I had that mo motivator, you know, I have, I have sure. to learn and I have to get better in English. And I hated that people were talking behind my back and I couldn't understand what they were saying. Well, I understand that. You know, when I worked for uh, many years, I worked for Philips, the Dutch company. Mm-hmm. And uh, when the uh, when I was with my colleagues from from Amsterdam, they would often speak in in Dutch, mm -hmm. and and I felt very excluded. Yeah. And so I, I know that feeling of, of D Dutch. Uh, I can't follow. I can follow German and some other languages, but not Dutch. The other complication you have in learning English is that Scientology is not really English per se. It, it has all its own unique terms. And, and it is hard. Scientology, I call it Scientologies, is yes. actually a, a language you have to learn. Yes. So, so I pretty much to, had to learn two languages at the same time. Yeah. Because there's no, I imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine there's no Russian translation for things like interbulation. No, they did have their own Scientology Glos uh, glossaries or whatever, you know, like a dictionary yes, sure. uh, that defines every single Scientology word. They did have them translated into Russian. Well, how, would you say in, how would you say in turbulation in Russian? I'm curious. 
It's actually not that far. It's an interbulatse. It's very close. <laughs> but I mean, is that an actual Russian word or is it just Scientology translated into Russian? I actually don't know. <laughs> uh, I, well, I'm just curious because sometimes I see, uh, you know, I see all these, like when uh, David Miscavige released the basics, he mm -hmm. showed them and he showed them all these languages. Yes. And it's, it's funny because Scientology is an invented word. That's true. So they, so they sometimes will translate Hubbard's words that he invented into other languages. Mm -hmm. And so they just have to basically use the same word. You know, like uh, uh, operating Thetan. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's not a word that's been around for you know a thousand years. Yes, but yeah. anyway, anyways, a lot of uh, there is a lot of Russian words that sound very similar to Eng uh, from you know English and Russian words that are very similar. Okay. So it's. Um, How would you say operating Thetan in Russian? Operativny Thetan. <laughs> So Thetan is just straight in English or yes, Russian, the same yes, word? Yes, yeah. I mean, the Scientology words, they were not translated. It was just, you know, put the Russian accent spin on it, and that's it. Well, that that's just a, a just a fascinating and a sight. So as a girl, you're learning you're learning the, the Scientology language, English. And yes. uh, so you're, you're a technical page. Mm-hmm. And did your pay increase? Do you make more money now that you're out of Purif? Um, yes. When I got when I got posted as a technical page, um, I was supposed to get fifty dollars a week, but that all depended on how your statistic was, um, and how not only your individual statistic for the week was, but how was the division in the department, and. Um, I know you're going to chime in on this, but the advanced organization made a lot of money for Scientology, period. Um, so we were always under scrutiny. Well, yeah, and it was interesting before the show we were talking. Now, I know that they make like 2 to $4 million a week, the, the, the flag service organization. Yes. It, it's, it's the big cash cow for Scientology. You told me that there were RTC reps around and there was always a lot of screaming and they were hovering over you guys to make sure you produced so they could bring in the money. Yes. What was the working environment with these, these RTC reps and other people and the focus on money and the tension and the pressure? Um, it was very stressful. And I mean, I, I got posted at 13. So being a 13 year old and having these men and women all dressed in black and they were all dressed in black, right? With the, with the gold, um, um, almost like an army gold, uh, pads on their shoulders and the whole very, you know, uh, uh Navy army ish looking, uh, very scary looking people would always come over and they would curse you out, yell at you. I mean, they, they can very, very well, it's like, it's almost in their nature to just chew you up and spit you out. And they were sure. very good at it. Yeah. And there is a lot of screaming and, 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 uh, for new time, uh, Scientology watchers, RTC is the religious technology center. That's where David Miscavige works. He is Captain David Miscavige in the Sea Org. And they own all the copyrights and trademarks. So they license them to Church of Scientology International, who licenses them, them to flag. Mm -hmm. And royalties are paid, management fees and things. So the Religious Technology Center is there to make sure they say that there's the ecclesiastical purity Yes. You know, the materials are applied properly, but they're really there to make sure the income comes in. And RTC can lie about it, but those bastards are there to make sure you, as 13 years old, are working, you know, 16, 18 hour days to help them bring in their millions of tax free dollars. Well, I also would like to add that RTC are like David Miscavige personal attack dogs as well. Oh, yeah. They're, they're his enforcers. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, uh, he runs the church through his enforcers, but he claims to have nothing to do. And when it comes to lawsuits, he claims to know nothing about, you know, the day-to-day -day affairs of the church when he's looking at every penny coming in and 
you know, everything else. Yeah. I mean, I heard from somebody that David Miscavige in the morning, you know, he does his routine. And one of the first things that he gets debriefed on, he always wants to know first thing in the morning, how was flag doing? How much money did flag make? That's like on top of his priority list, because I don't know if that's for sure. And that's just speculation, but you probably will know better. I think flag is one of the biggest money, money sources of off Scientology period. It is. Matt Pesh told me that, you know, and uh, Matt's fascinating to interview, you know, because he, he knows finances very well. And as they say, you know, flag is its, is its own world within Scientology. And as flag goes, the rest of the churches go. So if flag is up, the, the church is up. If flag goes down, the church goes down because that is that is where the main money comes from. Exactly. Um, now, now in terms of of, of you growing up, uh, you know, being a teenage girl, what are the what are the rules? Are you allowed to have a boyfriend, or or, or is it just work? It's all work. You are allowed to have a boyfriend if you could squeeze it in, you know, in between the 16 to 18 hours of work day, somewhere in there. But one of the serial rules is that you are not allowed to have any sexual activity until you get married. So, could so you hold hands or kiss? But you, you hold hands and you kiss. Now, if the guy decides to, you know, squeeze your butt cheek, that's heavy petting. That's that's like, oh my god, you have committed a crime. <laughs> <laughs> heavy petting. Uh, yes. <laughs> that was, I, the reason I'm laughing, I grew up in the Assemblies of God, which is very strict. Yes. And and heavy petting was an absolute no no. As was mixed bathing, which meant you couldn't swim in the same swimming pool as girls if you were a boy, you know, oh. or vice versa. Mixed bathing, like if you get boys and girls in the same pool, there could be kind of, you know, some hanky panky. There could be it could lead to heavy petting. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the same kind of thing. Now, your relationship with your mother, what post is she holding? Well, she actually finished the EPF very fast. She finished in three months. Um, and she, since she got posted, she actually started working as the night bathroom cleaner in the same castle. So you come to America to clean bathrooms at night? Yes, yes. And my mother was actually very upset when she started the EPF. They told her she started doing all the courses to prepare you to become a CIRG member. Um, one of the rules was that you cannot have children in a CIRG. And she didn't know before that point. And I remember we were standing outside like by the dumpsters. And because that's the only place you can smoke, like in the back by the dumpsters. My mother is a heavy smoker. And she was bawling her eyes out. And she was so upset because she, she just found out that she couldn't have any more children. I, I remember telling her, I'm like, well, why don't we just leave? <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm 11, so I'm like, I'm seeing my mother crying and she's so upset and she doesn't want, you know. I'm like, so why don't we just go? And she, I remember her telling me, go where? And I just remember her saying, she's like, I'm, I, I have no place to go here. And I'm definitely not going back to Siberia. So we're stuck, honey. We're stuck. Wow. Well, how does that make you feel? Uh, well, and, 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 the, and let me let me ask you a different way. Your mother can't have any children in the Sea Org. She's heartbroken. And do you know that when you grow up, you won't be allowed to have children? Exactly. If you stay in the Sea Org. That must have been like scary for you that you could grow up and not have children. For me, oh, it's a very touchy subject. <laughs> um, Let's just say my mother was not a perfect mother, far from being a perfect mother even before Scientology. Mm. And that is one thing ever since I was a child. I always tried, my purpose was to, when I grow up, I'm going to be a thousand percent better than she is. Sure. Yeah. And when I found out that I can't have children in the Sea Org at 11 years old, at 11, 
I already kind of had this idea that I don't want to stick around here for too long. <laughs> for me, finding that out at 11, I knew, okay, I'm not planning to have kids now, obviously. But at one point, I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to leave this place. And I remember as a, as a teenager and I was posted a flag and I would see um, the public coming in for services and they would have kids and they, you know, they have families and um, it would always pull my heartstrings. And I was like, that's all I want. I, I just, I just, I want to have a husband, I want to have kids, I want to have, I just want to have a normal life, like, I don't want to be stuck here for the rest of my life, working these crazy hours for God knows what, so I guess I kind of lost my faith in Scientology from the beginning. Well, absolutely, and and if, if you were, you know, every young person must have a a, a good life and those kinds of things and to think that you were going to be stuck in a life forever of endless drudgery screaming pressure for money ma you know making fifty dollars a week in a good week trapped with no no future that, yeah. would, cause, that would cause despair in a young person you don't have any money mm -hmm. you, you, you depend on your visa and like your mother said even if you left even if you guys blew the Sea Org, you don't have money, you don't have family, you don't have friends, and your only option is to go back to Siberia. Exactly. So you're really screwed in a lot of ways. Yeah. So I kind of, um, throughout my Sea Org life, I knew deep down that I definitely wanted to leave the Sea Org. I kind of bought into the whole Scientology thing um, that, you know, we're saving the planet. So... I wasn't, I wasn't, I had, I, I didn't have anything against Scientology. I just knew that eventually I would like to leave the Sea Org. I remember, um, speaking of boyfriends, um, I had like a, uh, not a nickname, but I've heard, you know, a couple of people talking behind my back and somebody told me, um, you know, within all the teenage boys on base, I had like a nickname that I was like untouchable. <laughs> and um I couldn't figure it out I was like why 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 am I untouchable and then it's true it's because I never really wanted to have a boyfriend or a relationship because um I knew I didn't want to stay in the Sea Org but in order for me to even have a, any kind of serious relationship I knew I had to marry a guy and I didn't want to marry a guy just so that I could have to go through divorce when I do decide to leave, because I, I really didn't want to be there for the rest of my life, deep down. So I basically didn't really want to date anybody. And uh, a, a lot of the young, you know, teenage boys are like, oh, she's untouchable. <laughs> but see, this makes this makes perfect sense to me. You would not want to become emotionally involved as your plan was to leave. Because yeah. that, wouldn't be, that wouldn't be fair to a young man that you married if your real intention was to leave the Sea Org. So that was emotionally very honest. Well, it's not. I, I didn't have a plan. I just... Um, no, I, but I, I, I understand yeah. what you're saying. You don't want to get close to anyone because you don't want to stay. Yes, because I have seen when people leave, they would tell them, you know, that they, they, it would be like, you either leave with your husband and your husband has to be on board with you, but a lot of times they would separate the couples and they would try to convince them individually not to leave. So I knew if I ever got married, and I would have to get married, that I would be put into a position of leaving my husband or try to convince my husband to come with me. And it's just going to put a lot of strain. And, 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 and I might have to leave somebody that I love or feel betrayed because they wouldn't leave with me. No, I, I understand that. I, I would not put myself in that position either if I were young. Yeah. And uh, because really what you're choosing, Katrina, is you're choosing your future. Yeah. And you need to be able to walk away with without strings attached. And Scientology does do that. They do close down your future in every possible way to keep you trapped in the Sea Org. Exactly. And they do use emotional blackmail, manipulation. 
you know, are you going to leave your husband or wife here? Well, and, and if you do, you know, what kind of criminal are you? You're not only abandoning the cause of Scientology, but you're deserting your husband or wife. And then they get all dramatic with it. Oh, yeah. I would be told um, by other, other, you know, teenage kids my age, some of them had, you know, willing to leave and they would go through all this ethics handling and all this stuff and they would be told like you're worthless if you leave what are you gonna do you're gonna end up just mopping floors at mcdonald's for the rest of your life like you you're just a worthless piece of shit and they would and i'm sorry for my language but that's the language they use they will they will call you a whore a bitch you're a motherfucker i mean any any way to put you down and really make your, your yourself they just make you feel so small that eventually you just give in and go whatever just oh, oh absolutely and I, and I remember Mark Headley was one of the first people to tell me this years and years ago after he left um, it was so fascinating that if you leave Scientology you will wind up at McDonald's flipping burger she'll be useless yes and Scientology one thing it does do that new uh, Scientology watchers should note Scientology is expert at invalidating people, dominating them, reducing them, destroying their self worth. Oh, yeah. And they're saying you only have value relative to this group and staying in Scientology and serving Scientology. Other, other than that, yes, you are a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. a and L. Ron Hubbard even wrote a bulletin that said people who leave the Sea Org are degraded beings. Yes, exactly. And they will call and, them DBs. And, yeah, DBs. And in Scientology, that's one of the worst things you can be as a degraded being. Yes. So they reduce you, they dehumanize you to a degraded being. And just spiritually in Scientology, that that means you have no eternity, no future, nothing. Exactly. You are degraded, you're beneath contempt. And that's part of the caste system in Scientology. I mean, and, uh, I personally, to this day, struggle with self-confidence um, because of the RTC and everybody else that would come around and constantly yell at you. And, you know, you could never do anything right. It was always like, um, what is that expression? A catch-22? <laughs> yes. Yes, it's catch-22. Where you do something and then it's like, oh, it's horrible. And then you try to fix that. Oh, no, you can't do this. It, you, no matter what, you were like the bad guy at the end of the day. And to this day, I still struggle with self-confidence and with just, you know, feeling like I try to do the best as I can. And I always try to do the right thing. And I feel very, def like, I, I always try to defend myself and sometimes I find myself in a situation where I'm like oh my god why am I defending myself so much <laughs> the other person isn't even attacking me but I have this need to kind of like you know I need to stand up for myself I'm doing it right like don't tell me I'm, I'm wrong and I feel like it's because of all those years of just constantly being beat on and just emotionally abused and just made feel like so small and, and unimportant and it really does so much mental damage to a person, especially like in teenage years when those years is when a person and, and the per personality of an adult is forming. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And if you're in a situation where there's so much, so much domination, invalidation, name calling, shaming, belittling, threats, exactly. deprivation, thrust on you. Yeah, of course, of course, it's going to cause some serious, serious issues in your development. Mm -hmm. You know, because really, Scientology thrusts you or anyone else who, who's young onto their own devices, and you've you've, you've got to you'll either succumb or you'll become vicious. Exactly. And the, the people who tend to rise become vicious because the Scientology rewards cruelty. Exactly. And, and, and there's no compassion. And, and the people who do not want to become cruel or vicious tend, tend to be, tend to, they're sensitive. So they, they, they feel that damage and that pain. And maybe in part two, we can talk about one, how you finally decide to leave the Sea Org and how, how you do it. And what are, what are the, 
what's the aftermath? What are the implications of leaving? You know, I'd really like to know what, what were the series of events that caused you to leave in our next interview in part two. Definitely. You know, and, and the personal cost you had to pay for leaving. Definitely. Well, Katrina, we're, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking and, you know, just kind of giving the listeners a feel for how a young girl from Siberia, Russia, winds up in an American hell. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the American um, dream that's a hellhole. Or to use a Russian word, it's a gulag. Yes. <laughs> and, and I wanted to get into... Oh, go ahead. It's kind of ironic, right? You you come to the most... You come to the country that's supposed to be, you know, a country of freedom and free speech and especially after, like, a Soviet Union, you know, and you end up becoming a slave in a prison and you don't even enjoy the rights of that you have in this country by Scientology. No, and, that, and that's one of the things that I'm focusing on in my Scientology Money Project and in my work is Scientology using the American First Amendment religious protections to create a nightmare slavery system that exploits children. Yeah. That exploits, in that fact, it exploits everyone that it comes into contact with. Exactly. And that's part of the problem of America. And that's part of the problem of the IRS is they will not go after Scientology. And they need to. Exactly. They're derelict, they're derelict in their duty and it's very dangerous for America to allow Scientology or any other cult to exist and to destroy people. And we'll leave it at that for now. But I appreciate uh, appreciate what you what you share with our listeners. I look forward to part two, where we can talk about how how you make your escape from Scientology. Well, thank you for having me, Jeff. Oh, it was a pleasure. And I, and, you know, the, the the time flies by. I look forward to part two for Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Katrina, for being on. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.